afternoon, everybody. Am I on? I am. So uh, my name is Adrian DeLuca. I head up the partner solution architecture function uh, for uh, AWS across APAC. And today I thought for a little bit of confidence on stage, I've asked Jill, uh, which you've all already seen this morning, to come and join me to talk about our, uh, our topic. Good um, afternoon. Thank you, Jill. Um, so first of all, any salespeople in the room? Any accountants? Only okay, doors relic, are that only way. Only the new relic ones, you're all right. <laughs> yeah, you might want to at least block your ears on this because I'm going to be unapologetically technical. I am a uh, software developer, so um, this is the sort of stuff that I, I live for, um, even to my wife's horror. But uh, what we wanted to talk about this afternoon is you know, this ever-evolving trend around serverless and what that actually means uh, in the new world. Uh, you know, uh, it was funny because I, I was looking at some of the new marketing slogans that are coming out. You know, we're changing, you know, monitoring to observability. Um, but things are really, really changing, I think, and, and they have a lot more purpose. So uh, what we're going to do is take you on a bit of a, a journey uh, on what's happening in the real world. Uh, Jill's actually going to share some of the uh, fantastic integrations that New Relic have done with the AWS platform. Uh, and then what I want to leave you with is um, some useful tips and resources. I never like coming off stage without giving you some additional things to go and, uh, and learn some more. So let's dig into it uh, and, and go. But how about I start with a little bit of a, a, a journey, right? Um, I remember my own journey. I was a... Um, uh, you know, C++ Java developer way back in the days. Um, one of my flagship projects was, was building uh, whitepages.com.au and, and yellowpages.com.au. Uh, I hate talking about it because it's embarrassing how we actually <laughs> built it compared to today's practices. Uh, you know, hairball C++ code, uh, CGI bins. Uh, we did not have load balances. Uh, you know, where we had a scale up, very legacy IBM database, um, and still, I don't know how we managed to get it to scale and work in the web era, uh, but I learned a lot along the way. But, um, you know, if we look at what's happened to us software developers over the last, you know, couple of years, you know, cloud came along and really took four uh, in 2006, and what that meant for developers is they didn't even have to ask permission to go and spin up a server, uh, and it made it really, really easy. What happened a couple of years later is we started to see our practices change with DevOps coming in. You know, waterfalls started to go away. You know, um, pushing code went from being an event and a dot version something to being something that we just wake up and do almost every single day. 2012 is when we really started to see microservices taking hold. And a lot of the microservices that we did was just, you know, peeling off bits of of our applications or building new ones, you know, polyglot uh, programming and things like RESTful interfaces, you know, we started to really take, take hold there. But, you know, it wasn't until we saw containerization when we actually made the developers happy. Because when I'm a DevOps developer, and I am no longer just responsible for building the thing, but actually running the thing, I want to have control about how it's deployed. And what obviously, containerization technology, and now obviously with Kubernetes does, is it allows us to package all the dependencies and run it anywhere that we want, okay? Since then, obviously, um, you know, we've, we saw, uh, we saw um, serverless come in, and you know, it's, it's amazing to think that, that Lambda is already five years old. I still remember when AWS announced Lambda, it was before I actually joined, and I said, wow. I can really come and bring my code to a cloud provider and they're going to run it for me. Um, and we've learned a lot since then in terms of running this at production scale. Today we're talking a lot more about not just running 10 microservices or 20 microservices, but thousands of microservices. And that's why we need things like service meshes to be able to do cloud brokerage and, and those sorts of uh, uh, things. Or service discovery, I should say, not cloud brokerage. That's a naughty word. <laughs> um, so if we think about you know, what, uh, what, what happened when we brought containerizations to cloud, what we solved was uh, a lot of the scale problems. Now, if you look at services from AWS like AWS Fargate uh, and compare that and contrast that to ECS, the 
elastic container service, you no longer have to worry about scaling those clusters or choosing instance types and memory. Fargate can do all that sort of stuff for you, which is really, really awesome. But what serverless did and where it really changed the game is that you no longer even have to worry about uh, you know, bringing your images and dependencies along, right? So literally bringing different functions and being able to decompose a lot more of that application into far more granular levels means that we can really decouple a lot of that business logic, but most importantly, it's extensible. When we want to add new features or consume new services, it's really, really easy to be able to do that in a serverless environment without mucking up everything else. So, um, <laughs> one thing I like to do is read analyst reports, but not for reasons that you might think. I find them quite funny, quite frankly, okay? And this is probably one of the funniest ones, right, uh, from, from Forrester. People still haven't figured out a great use case for serverless beyond um, batch jobs and, and cron. Who agrees with that? Oh, God. That is absolutely <laughs> false. Um, I'm going to sit down with his analyst one day and really give him an earful. Um, that is absolutely not true. And I'll tell you why, because I'm going to prove it to you. These are just some of the customers that are using serverless today. And look at the different use cases it's being used for. We've got you know, uh, lots of B2C type uh, companies like uh, Zillow that are using it for operational management, live dashboarding. We've got uh, you know, the Major League Baseball, for example, that's also running a lot of the major um, uh, analytics. So if you're ever in the United States of America um, and you look at StatCast, a lot of that in the back end, all those analytics are being batch processed using uh, Lambda. Interactive back ends, you know, if we look at uh, what Slack and Twilio are using it for things like webhooks, every time you want to do an integration to Slack, it's actually talking to an API gateway backed by a Lambda function. Uh, data flows, if we look at Thomson Reuters, you can imagine lots of streaming data that they're uh, collecting. Um, they're doing a lot of ETL work uh, inside of Lambda functions. And of course, we've got all sorts of other uh, really interesting use cases around um, automation with uh, companies like Netflix and, and Autodesk. So if anyone tells you that you can't use it for anything serious, slap them in the face, please, okay? All right, let's now go through some of the, um, some of the use cases that, that we see and where serverless starts. Now, this is where a lot of people start the journey with serverless, right? They want to create an API endpoint, um, you know, they don't want to worry about things like uh, the security and the load balancing and so forth. So they'll use a service like AWS API Gateway for that, right? Really good way to do that. They connect that to a Lambda function, that Lambda function maybe processing some of that data and writing it into a DynamoDB table. Very, very standard, stock of the mill, kind of synchronous, um, synchronous interaction, right? What happens when we introduce streaming data and we use something like Amazon Kinesis? Well, suddenly your synchronous function becomes asynchronous. What happens with asynchronous functions? Anybody? Anyone? Come on, there's devs in this room, right? So if I introduce an asynchronous function, right, I need to start thinking about things like queuing, batching, right? How do I actually go and manage that when I've got you know, a function that is quite static in code and may not be aware of what might be consuming that? So I've got typical you know, consumer producer type of patterns that I need to think about. Now, what if I start coupling all these things together? So in this case here, um, not only am I streaming data in, but I'm pulling data off, doing some sort of you know, aggregation and maybe storing it out to uh, a service like uh, S3. Right? You start to have things like concurrency, contention issues that might be, um, and timing that you need to start thinking about. So Lambda is really, really cool for doing really, really fast things, but it can get really complex very quickly. These days, this is how we're actually seeing Lambda being used. Now, we actually released a service uh, at um, reInvent two years ago called AWS Step Functions. What AWS Step Functions is brings complete composability of your Lambda functions together. And this is the sort of stuff that we see. We see state machines being built. 
Why? It's a lot more cleaner to understand. It's a lot more extensible if I want to add features and capabilities to that. Um, you know, but it also opens up a lot more opportunity for issues. If I start having Lambda calls or recursive Lambda calls um, inside of this code, how do you start debugging all of this when I've got a state machine that it's operating in? Can become very, very, uh, very problematic. Or if I have race conditions, for example, in the way I'm actually ac accessing the data, okay? So as cool as Lambda really is, debugging is an absolute nightmare, okay? And I'm sure all of us can relate to, you know, the six stages of debugging hell, right? In <laughs> trying to understand how to debug a distributed application. Well, the reality is, is as we start to see these environments scale and grow, the heterogeneous of that, and it's a very difficult word, I'm still convinced it's not real, um, but if you look at the typical type of distribution that we have, we are more polyglot than ever, and it's only getting more. We see new languages like Go, for example, are starting to be used um, in enterprise contexts, right? I still remember when Node.js was a joke inside of banks, and now we're seeing it being used, you know, for uh, some, some very, very serious things. The other thing that we also see is that the number of lamb as the number of lambdas keeps growing exponentially, being able to orchestrate these and use them well becomes the priority, okay? So we can do things fast, we can do things cheap, but actually orchestrating these um, becomes issue. And this is actually a real dashboard, right, Jill, from, uh, from New Relic that just you know, shows you the things like the number of invocations that we start to get in some of these very, very large uh, environments. So, you know, instrumenting becomes absolutely critical as you scale and grow, okay? And, you know, I love this image here. So if you look really closely, you'll see what the actual operators are doing. They're shopping on Amazon.com, okay? <laughs> so what's happening in the background is that their instrumentation is hopefully working really, really well, but is it really, right? While your uh, operators, yeah, look, they're what actually they shopping. Actually buy? Oh, bikes. Bikes, Back that guy's to, looking for some pants over so there. So Bill was telling us about developers and bikes earlier. <laughs> oh, they must love Lycra or something, it, right? Maybe. Yeah, so, you know, instrumentation and metrics become, you know, really, really critical, but the granularity of those metrics um, is what becomes even more critical. So to talk about that, I'm going to hand over to Jill. Thank you very much. Um, so that was a great tee up, Adrian. Thank you very much for that. Um, Lambda monitoring is absolutely in the spotlight, and uh, I hear you all say, but we've got CloudWatch. <laughs> yep, and we've got X-Ray, but that, uh, that absolutely does provide you with a level of data, but it certainly doesn't help you manage the complexity of the environments that uh, developers are starting to build. So, you know, if we start at the at the other side, controlling complex environments is really the number one reason why you need a very strong observability platform that allows you to see all of your data end to end and in context. So the, from the metrics, the events, the logs, and also the trace data as we'll delve into in, in just a minute. Um, the other thing that's you know, interesting with Lambda, often uh, when you're monitoring a Lambda environment, you don't really see inside the code. You don't see what's happening in every invocation and therefore something that you mightn't even see, a very small problem, probably won't even bubble to the surface, but may be costing you money and it might be costing you customer experience, right? Um, the second piece, I mean, you, you touched on that, how do you manage the application at scale? Uh, you know, a Lambda function on its own might be great, but when you put it into uh, a spider's web or a hairball environment, how do you really know what's going on? Um, and how do you scale that environment? And then, really importantly, in order to deliver for, for your own customers, you have to be able to, to troubleshoot and, you know, get to the root cause of a problem really quickly. Now, you made a very good observation on that picture that I had not spotted. <laughs> um, and that was that everyone was, was shopping online. So as much as we would love for all of our New Relic customers to be looking at New Relic every minute of the day, your jobs 
are actually uh, you know, doing other things. Business as usual is developing code or doing something else of value to your business and therefore alerting when there are issues or when there are about to be issues so you can get ahead of them is absolutely critical. Um, so what I'd like to talk about just for the next five, 10 minutes is how New Relic monitors Lambda differently from most other monitoring and observability solutions you'll have seen. So first of all, we don't just look at the outside of the Lambda function, like how many invocations there have been, for example, or the duration of them. We create a wrapper that gathers detailed information about what is happening inside the Lambda function, and I'll step you through what that actually looks like. From there, the, the data gets in real time pushed up to AWS, um, ingested through a Lambda. Which of surprise, course. surprise. <laughs> Uh, and then the data is available in New Relic for you to be able to see that in the context of the rest of your environment. So let's take a quick look at what that might actually look like in, in New Relic. First of all, you can, as you enter into, you saw Lou showing you New Relic 1 this morning. Um, Lambda is a first class citizen or, or an entity within New Relic, so you can revolve your view around all of the Lambda functions that you have in your environment. The second thing is that it's gonna float the, uh, show you the health essentially of each of those by floating the ones that need attention up to the top. So you'll see yesterday our environment was working really well and everything is green, but should there be any issues in there, you would see the red and ambers and they would float to the top so that you could straight away drill into those. So that's step one you get a high level view of all of the Lambda functions very quickly. Uh, the second piece is, we talked about CloudWatch. It's important that we capture the CloudWatch data. That is absolutely uh, a fundamental part of understanding how the Lambda functions are running within the broader context of your environment. And you'll see in there, um, you know, you'll get the number of invocations over time, You'll see the, the duration or the time it takes for each of those invocations to run. Um, you'll see the errors, but those are errors in relation to the entire uh, invocation falling over essentially, not what's happening inside it. And then various other metrics, essentially everything that you can see in CloudWatch. But if you're using New Relic, you get, uh, and you probably all know and love APM, we give you an APM view inside the Lambda function. So what does that really mean? Well, you'll see at the, the top there in the duration chart, um, if you can look very carefully, you'll see a wee slice of, of yellow and a tiny, tiny slither of green in there as well. So we break down uh, the overall duration into the amount of time spent, let's say, making external calls or uh, talking to DynamoDB or the database or whatever it might be, and the amount of time spent in code. So that's absolutely critical when you want to, you know, tune those functions for better performance. Um, then you can also see the cold start. So I guess anyone who develops Lambda functions knows and loves the cold start or not. <laughs> not. Um, <laughs> and Adrian's actually going to talk a little bit about some uh, enhancements, if you like, that you know will make this less of an issue. But you can absolutely see any cold starts that are happening within the environment. You're also you'll also see there the error rate, and uh, the error rate for us is actually. Um, a bit more detailed and I'll go into that in just a second. But if you want to drill down into the granular detail of every single invocation that has happened within a particular time period, then absolutely you can get down to that really granular level of information as well. Um, most importantly, you get the visibility of the error from within the invocation. So what you'll see at the bottom here is um, You've got the number of errors and then the, the error class and the error message. So you'll see there's an error there. Uh, it's happened three times, undefined problem. Well, that's really helpful, right? Um, but you might want to try and figure out exactly what's going on there. 
Uh, had you not been using New Relic, you wouldn't even have any had any visibility into any errors actually happening at all. So from there, you can then drill into that particular error class and get a little bit more detail around the summary inf uh, information for those particular errors. And then most importantly and uh, beautifully, you get the stack trace. So it tells you exactly the line of code within the Lambda function where that issue is actually happening. So not only are you being alerted of issues that you wouldn't normally see, but it's telling you exactly where in the Lambda code that you need to go to fix that. And that is really powerful and really time saving as well. Then um, from there, and probably most importantly, in a very, very complex environment, you heard Lou talking about distributed tracing this morning. And for us, um, the distributed trace is what stitches your whole environment together. So that's what allows you to see a transaction, um, how it transitions through every single function, application, service in your whole environment. And you'll see down at the bottom there, this particular trace, you know, starts off on a, on a web page. Um, you know, it's doing some, somebody's trying to buy something, probably those guys that are <laughs> monitoring uh, new rel using New Relic. And then down at the bottom there, you'll see that the, uh, the Lambda is called, so you can see exactly where in the process it's happening. And should there be an issue, that would also float to the top. And then if you click on the, on the Lambda span itself, it's gonna pop up information um, related to that particular invocation as part of that end-to-end -end, uh, transaction and you'll get really detailed information about that. And then uh, even more importantly, not only do we capture the Lambda function, but then if the Lambda function itself actually calls another AWS service, like in this case, uh, DynamoDB, we then capture that next level down as well. So you're seeing everything that is happening across the whole environment. Um, I'm gonna just show you in this case, not only can we drill into the DynamoDB information, but you'll see at the top there, it says one anomalous span detected. So that is where we are able to apply some machine learning essentially to look at outliers within the environment and detect when a particular um, part of a, uh, an end-to-end -end trace is causing an issue or it's much slower, for example, than all of, its, uh, all of the other invocations or database calls. And it will then let you drill into that data and um, figure out why that particular one was, was anomalous, which uh, is actually pretty powerful. So mm -hmm. in other words, you're able to not only see from a Lambda perspective what's happening, you know, how Lambda's performing as a whole, how it's performing inside each of the invocations, but more importantly, in the end-to-end -end environment, exactly what is happening so that if something should go wrong, you can find out where the issue is pretty quickly, very which important. is very powerful. So New Relic has a number of um, AWS services or integrations that we have created, and those are there um, out of the box for all of you to use and connect and gather data from your AWS environment. Over and above that, we have a tool called Flex that will let you connect to any data source you like essentially and pull that into New Relic as well as all of the, the open data that Lou was talking about this morning in the keynote. So that ability to pull all of the data in and see it um, in the one place through various different curated views becomes really powerful. But what's, uh, what's next? Interesting question. Mm, so what's, want to know. Yeah. What's next for New Relic? Well, first of all, um, for those of you that were there during the Service New South Wales presentation this morning, you saw that giant service map. Um, 
that was put up, which essentially was the whole Service New South Wales environment and the dependencies between each of the services. So what we are doing at the moment is extending the amount of services that are then visible within that map to include all of the AWS services that we see. So everything that you can see in the distributed trace at an individual transaction level will be floated up to that higher level view that um, managers and executives like to see that is the whole, the whole environment. Um, the second piece that is very exciting for us is a concept called workloads. Um, and workloads allow you to group a set of entities or applications together from um, maybe what, what's important to you as a developer. So you look after you know, these particular Lambda functions mm -hmm. and uh, this particular set of business functionality. You can then group that into a workload so that, that is the, the context of that is what you're monitoring. And then not only that, you can start to apply things like SLIs and SLOs and create your error budgets and look at that kind of workload as your unit of work mm -hmm. and the, the way that you're measuring as a whole. So um, watch this space. That's something that's new and will be coming out in the not too distant future. Awesome. But what's happening from an AWS perspective with Lambda? Nice. Love that. Uh, love the granularity, Jill. I'm always... Um, you know, jealous, quite frankly, <laughs> that you can get to, to some of those. So let me just talk about some of the things that we're doing with, with Lambda. Um, I'm going to be a little bit peeking into the future, but I also want to peek a little bit at the past as well, because um, as Jill mentioned, probably the single biggest thing that we received feedback on was the cold starts, okay? Now, there are ways around cold starts. You can use CloudWatch rules to be able to... Um, instrument the number of invocations and you can warm a pool ready uh, ahead if you start to really look at some of that workload but quite frankly it's not a really intelligent way um, what you what we actually announced uh, last month and will be rolled out to the sydney region very shortly is some vpc networking improvements for lambda uh, as you can imagine again as, as some of the bigger benefits of coming to AWS is our constantly evolving EC2 instance pools. So we're actually moving a lot of the Lambda underlying EC2 instances to the new modern ones that are using bare metal, uh, that are using the 100 uh, gigabit per second networking, and obviously uh, the new uh, generation of Intel processors. So uh, between that and some of the work that we've done in actually doing some predictive analysis on, on those Lambdas, um, that is a problem that is steadily going to go away. Um, we're going to continue to see integrations. You know, what people love about Lambda is it does create this concept of, you know, event-driven architecture. Uh, and that means that we need to continue to evolve in integrating it with our own services. A service that we announced in September uh, called EventBridge. EventBridge is effectively a pub-sub bus yeah. that allows uh, SaaS providers effectively to create inter-process communications between AWS accounts, okay? Uh, really, really um, great for being able to broadcast messages and um, you know, create that um, producer-consumer type of model in, um, you know, across different types of SaaS applications. Um, again, this is an old one, but one that we're seeing being adopted really at scale is bring your own runtime, okay? Uh, we announced that at reInvent last year. We call it the uh, Lambda Runtime API. Uh, so you can bring your own specific version of the runtime, the version, um, and your functions uh, along with that. So it's really interesting to see how that's playing out. Uh, and the other one that we also announced earlier this year is Lambda Layers, right? So if you've got a Lambda function that relies on a library, before we had to package all that up, and as, of course, as I described, as your Lambda functions start to grow and evolve, um, you don't want to keep packaging the same zip files with the same code. So you can actually make external invocations of code and package those up together. So we're seeing all of these three things coming together, um, you know, really in an interesting way, especially with step functions, um, to, to really bring it to the um, enterprise scale. All right, let's start to bring this home a little bit. So uh, just to kind of recap some of the things that we talked about, you know, structured logging is absolutely important. You know, we talked about CloudWatch. You know, another one of my favorite services is CloudTrail, right, where you can monitor all the invocations of AWS APIs, and that's also really uh, important in understanding that. So, you know, if you really want to be serious about um, dis 
you know, distributed logging, you have to do distributed tracing. And although I love, and, uh, I love CloudWatch, um, when we start to get to these big environments and you start getting serious, you need a product like New Relic, okay? So that's really when you get serious. Measure what matters. I think Jill started to talk about these and you saw them in the screenshots. You know, things like invocations, durations, um, errors, latency, memory is also really important because with Lambda you still need to define memory boundaries for your functions. And sometimes what we see is if you don't right size the memory, it means your lambdas run for longer and could be costing more, okay? Um, the other big thing is um, reserved concurrency, okay? So in each AWS account, you will have a reserved concurrency of how many lambdas that you can run. Why? Because underneath the covers, what we're doing is we're provisioning a certain amount of under underlying capacity for your account to be able to run those at scale. Again, we don't stop you if you overstep those boundaries, but that means you, your invocation or duration times can start to blow out, and that then starts to play into your SLAs. So again, all the more reason to really understand all these metrics in context with a product like New Relic. And also downstream dependencies. You know, when I work with a lot of, um, you know, uh, software providers that are bridging into old code, they said, you know, I've put an API gateway at the front and I've you know, I'm fanning out my lambdas, but it's still slow. Well, that's because they're still talking to a legacy traditional, you know, relational database, or they're using some other legacy service that is not distributed, right? So again, how do you start to find those when you're bridging modern application development with, you know, traditional, right? You, it's just really, really hard to do um, at scale. Um, what we didn't get time to talk about today was pipelines, right? Um, there's a really good, and uh, video of this very similar presentation that was done at reInvent last year. Go to YouTube and watch it. It was with Capital One. Uh, they talk about how they built their own custom pipeline for, for maintaining their serverless code. Because why? It's important not just to build and maintain, but maintaining versioning, mm. right? You want your developers to maintain a good level of governance and cadence around versioning your Lambda code as well. All right, as I said, and as I promised, this is the time to get your phone out. Um, here are some really cool resources that I suggest you go and have a look. The first one is a couple of GitHub repos uh, that we have. Uh, the first one is a custom parser that we built for CloudWatch uh, metrics. Um, for those of you still kind of let, yet to go um, with, um, with serverless, there's a great serverless um, starter kit that our architects have built. Um, another big thing that's happened over the last two years is that there is now a, you know, uh, a serverless framework uh, to build on, and we've built our own. So we've got the serverless application framework, so it's got all the necessary cloud formations to start getting you going with templates. Um, also some really good blogs, these are not AWS blogs, by the way. Um, so if you wanna learn more about kind of serverless observability in terms of patterns, there's some good ones. Uh, and again, you know, one of the great things I love about New Relic is that you can go fire it up today just by going to the AWS uh, marketplace. So. With that, I'm gonna leave you with this. You know, we, uh, we software developers <laughs> are very binary, Indeed. right? So we're either on one side of that on the other, uh, and hopefully, you know, by using some of this, uh, what we've talked about today, you're on uh, the left side of the that, God. right? So, uh, uh, so yes, um, hopefully you found that useful. If you'd like to know more, um, please come over to the AWS stand. We're the ones with the coffee cart. Um, happy to have a chat further. So thanks very much and thank you, Jill. Thank you.